literally all over the world, Mongolia, uh, Africa, uh, Eastern Europe, spoken in schools. Obviously, I don't know all those languages, so they have to be translated, but I've had the privilege to speak about virginity, sexual purity in all of those countries. So I am a, uh, maybe like the, you know, maybe I have a split personality, I don't know. <laughs> But I'm in the religious, spiritual world one day, and the next day I'm speaking about living an abstinent lifestyle when it comes to sexuality in the public world. And I know that I cannot bring my religious, spiritual convictions into that setting. So I have been forced by virtue of having convictions about sexual purity, yet having the ability and the opportunity to speak to teenagers and in some cases parents do a lot of parent meetings. To speak about this subject, I've had to, if you will, secularize something that is very, uh, a very deep-seated conviction in my life, something I've even taught my own kids. Um, so today, as I stand in front of you, I want to articulate some of the unspoken values of living a sexually pure or abstinent life, or even using an old-fashioned puritanical word called virginity that nobody uses anymore because it's not politically correct. But, having said that, one of the unspoken values that, we, that affects every one of us, regardless of who we are, where we are, and how old we are, is the financial of the thing that goes on in our lives because of sexual, um, the choice to not be abstinent, to have sex outside marriage. As you can see on the slide behind me, uh, 2008, maybe I didn't dig deep enough, I don't know, maybe there's more current statistics than that, but we'll have to live with this, that it cost the federal and state governments $10.9 billion to fund unwanted pregnancy because of people that do not abide by an abstinent lifestyle. Now, as I speak to teenagers, the financial consequences, an unspoken thing talk, talking about, it doesn't cost them anything because they go through it, their parents need to pay for it, or more often than not, the government pays for it. And most of us in this room, and maybe those of you listening, except for a few of you listening to us uh, via internet or some other form, uh, we don't understand $10.9 billion. We can't wrap our brain around that, but it's an incredible cost. And as you can also see on the screen right here, the great state of Texas leads the states of the Union with $1.2 billion of that cost. So regardless of who we are, there's an unspoken financial cost. I want to also talk to you today about the unspoken value of virginity is that it rejects the mockery that promote, that, that treats innocence as ignorance. As you can see on the screen, the picture on your left, my right, that is actually taken on July the 15th, 1978, right here in Lubbock, Texas. That is my wife and I and our wedding party right out here on the loop at Trinity Church, the day we got married. As we stand on that stage on July the 15th, 1978, we were both virgins. We were both sexually pure. We had never had any kind of sexuality, sexual activity with anyone. The evening after that wedding was over was the first time I had ever had sex in my life. I didn't know what I was doing, but it sure was fun. And as we say in West Texas, with practice, we've gotten gooder and gooder and gooder. And that's a good thing for us. The picture that is on your right and on my left, those are two of my three children who both were virgins on their wedding day. I have a third child that uh, made some decisions and made some choices that he was not able to say that. And that doesn't make him any less of a person or someone I love any less. It's just the facts. Now, the interesting thing about the statement that I have on the screen is that the, vow, the unspoken value of virginity is that it rejects, it pushes away the innocent, the, the mockery that treats innocence as ignorance. There are some very famous figures in our country, most currently and most recently, Tim Tebow, who is a professional football player for the New York Jets. He's a virgin and proclaims it out loud. I wonder in the locker room if his innocence is mocked as ignorance. Back from my generation, I guess I've lived in uh, West Texas all of my life, but I have to say, and to the chagrin of many of my friends, my favorite NBA basketball team is the Los Angeles Lakers. I've watched them. Uh, Jerry West made me want to watch the Los Angeles Lakers. That dates me. That means I'm just an old fart. That's okay. But you know what? During the era when Urban Magic Johnson was doing whatever he was doing and having sex with whoever he was having sex with, ever how often he was having sex with that... 
that person, that individual, in the same locker room, playing on the same team, winning the same NBA championship, was a man by the name of A.C. Green, who until he was in his mid-40s, he was a virgin. Do you think that his innocence was mocked as ignorance within the context of the way Magic Johnson and other NBA players were living even then and now? I want to submit to you folks that regardless of how our culture treats our virginity or our innocence, it's still ours. We still own it. In the year 2002 and 2003, the faculty, along with the undergraduate student body of Duke University, conducted a campus-wide survey about the old concept that we would call dating. And they found out that 70% of their student body in the year 2002 and 2003 no longer traditionally dated. What they found out that 70% of their student body did was they went as groups to parties and just hooked up. Now, when I was growing up, we called that a one-night stand. We have now grown up, later generations called it casual sex. Now we come to the place where movies are made called Friends with Benefits. Or movies have been made, no strings attached. In the same year at Duke University, along with the same study, they asked in the classroom, how do you define hooking up? One student said fast food sex. Another student said instant gratification. Another female student this was shocking to me, said, no emotional baggage. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know, and I have not tried to insult you or tell it any way, shape, fashion, shape, fashion, or form, but sex is so much more than physical. It involves the mental, the emotional, the financial, as I've talked about. It involves your reputation, and to make the statement that says there's no emotional attachment, to me, is asinine. The unspoken value of innocence, of virginity, is that it rejects the fact that it treats our innocence as ignorance. Secondly, today I want to talk to you about the unspoken value of abstinence or virginity is that it retains for a single beloved one what is appropriately theirs. I hold in my hand today, I travel with these everywhere I go. I have two toothbrushes. They are nasty, they're gross, they've been around the world with me several times. Wherever I go, I get a student up and I ask him to volunteer. Have you eaten? Yes or no. Did you eat before school, after school? When did you eat? Uh, well, I ate on my way to school. Well, did you brush your teeth? I did. No. Would you like to brush your teeth with one of my toothbrushes? No. Why? Because they're gross. One of them is missing bristles and they just get nastier as the years go by. I said, so why would you not want to put this in your mouth? And they, I mean, it's obvious. Don't know where it's been. Don't know what it's been doing. Don't know who it's been doing it with. I ask them, when you spend the night with your grandmother, when you spent the night with your best friend recently, did you, when you forgot your toothbrush, did you use your grandmother's toothbrush? Ooh, no, gross, I would never do that. Your own flesh and blood, you won't use their toothbrush. Well, I don't get it. We may have people in this audience, in this listening audience, that in the hook, current hookup culture on the college campus or in the high school, people have sex with people, but they don't know where they've been, what they've been doing, or who they've been doing it with on a weekly, consistent basis. And we wonder why sexually transmitted diseases are overrunning our world. According to Safe Lab Center for the Research of Sexually Transmitted Diseases, and you can check out their website by that name, Safe Lab Center, they tell us that 66% of the people that have sexually transmitted diseases in our world were under the age of 25. I'm confused. If you won't stick a nasty toothbrush in your mouth that you don't know where it's been, what it's been doing, or who it's been doing it with, why would you go to a party and hook up with someone that you don't know where they've been, what they've been doing, or who they've been doing it with? But I'm accused of being ignorant because of my innocence. I don't get it. As the picture portrays my wheel that has STDs on it, has no consequence on it, and has pregnancy on it, and, and, and yes, there is such a thing as no consequence, but maybe there's such a thing as no consequence physically, but mentally and emotionally, this is the unspoken value of absence. There's always a consequence. 100% of the time. So the student gets up and spins the wheel because they hooked up. 
and it's illustrative of taking a chance in their lifestyle. Thirdly, the unspoken value of, innocence, of virginity is that it repels the invasion of mind, will, and emotions that lost virginity allows. I want to attack the phrase lost virginity. I lost it on such and such night. We were on Farm Road 1333 at 2.01 a.m. in the back of Billy Bob's pickup. The reason I say it like that is because everybody remembers their first time. And I could stand up here and say today that somehow here's my cell phone in my back pocket, but I laid it down because I didn't want to feel the weight of it in my pocket while I was speaking. And I go out to my car and I go, oh, where's my cell phone? I lost it. It means I forgot where I put it. Nobody forgets where they put their virginity. You didn't lose it. You gave it up. By choice. And when you choose not to give it up, you repel. You push away the hurt from your mind, your emotions, your heart, your reputation. Uh, the, the picture I have on the screen is obvious of a couple that's just gotten married with a great deal of consternation on their face. I don't know what they're thinking. I just put that picture up there. But I'm picturing on my wedding night, I never had to worry about my wife comparing me to another man. I never had, she never had to worry about me comparing her to another woman and their sexual encounters. I was not compared physically, sexually, mentally, or emotionally. I don't know about you, but that made me feel extremely secure. And I'm not even mentioning at this juncture the chance of having being married to someone or having sex with someone who's had multiple sexual partners and the real reality of getting a sexually transmitted disease, curable or not curable. That's why I have in my back pocket, I have a third toothbrush. Behold, a virgin toothbrush. It's never been used, it's never been touched. And I asked the student on stage, would you like to use this toothbrush? Absolutely. Why? Because I know where it's been, what it's been doing, and what it hasn't, or where it hasn't been. That's what I was on my wedding night. But you see, we push away, we repel the value, the unspoken value of virginity is we push back against the cook-up culture that is existing in our current world today and say, I will not partake. I will not take the risk. I emotionally, physically, mentally, or financially, and their choices become a financial burden. As a teenager, they may not be cognitively aware of the financial responsibility that is put on the rest of us as adults. But one day they will. And finally today, the value of virginity exercises the self-control that allows us to live a life that will sustain a fuller sense of self-worth. What does self-worth say? It says we're valuable. We're worth something. Self-control is a great phrase. And we, I could give you a psychological, technically correct definition, but I prefer the practical definition of self-control. is knowing that you can, but deciding that you won't. Think about that. And it goes, I've never heard anybody else say this next phrase you're going to see on the screen. I've never read it in a book. I don't know. If, I, I wouldn't quite be so bold as to think I'm the only one that's ever said this. Maybe I'm the only one that's ever said it this way. But we need to learn to think about the end at the beginning. Think about your consequences before you ever start. And, you know, as I travel and speak from high school to high school, city to city, town to town, country to country in some ways, I think that if I could get young people to learn that principle, if I could get you to learn that principle, we could change the world by thinking about the end at the beginning. Think about our consequences on a physical level, an emotional level, a financial level, and, and of course I am preempted from talking about the spiritual consequences and, and, and so I won't even go there. But it's still a very real reality for every one of us thinking about our choices and how we're going to make this life work. A word to parents today. Research shows that if you'll talk to your kids about sexuality, no, you don't have to have the Jerry Springer show in your living room. That's not what I'm asking. 
But if you don't talk to your children about the consequences, the physical, mental, and emotional, and financial consequences of making these choices, guess what? It is statistically proven that when a child has your attention on this matter and you speak directly to it, not around it, it is statistically proven that they will drink less. They will explore sexuality less. They will start dating at a later age rather than an early age. Why? Because they've got your attention, parents. They don't need somebody else's attention. As a career worker with young people, I'm absolutely convinced we don't have a teenage problem, we've got a parent problem. If we could get you parents more involved in your teen's life, we could solve a lot of their issues because they have your attention. They don't have to seek it in another way. Maybe there's somebody listening to the sound of my voice today and what you recognize is that you've made a mistake. I want to boldly declare to you, failure's never final. There's always a second chance. Maybe you've been wondering why I hold, I'm holding this yellow piece of paper in my hand. Actually, it's two pages. Actually, it was a letter written to me, one of thousands of letters I get on a yearly basis from the students. The amazing thing about this letter, it was written in 2002, and it's written from a student teacher. I won't bore you by reading it. I've read it often enough publicly that I can tell you what it says. I listened to you for the very first time when I was a freshman in high school. I listened to you for the second time when I was a junior in high school. I'm sitting here in this audience listening to you for the third time as a student teacher at the very same school. With tears in my eyes, I am wishing that I had listened to you the first two times I heard you because I am one of those students that you always talk about. No, I did not get pregnant. No, I did not get a sexually transmitted disease. But I have literally lost count how many men I had sex with. I want to tell you thank you for continuing to impress upon students the importance of their choices in the area of sexuality. On the back page of her letter, she writes, I know that you're a Christian, but I know that you can't say anything about it in public school as I can here. I've heard you speak at the church. I want you to know that the things that you've stood for have made a difference in my life. You've made a difference in my life. I've realized I've made mistakes. She writes at the bottom of her letter, she says, I remember hearing you talk about secondary virginity, how to start over when you've made a mistake. I regret to inform you, not insult you, but inform you that you might already know this, Failure might not ever be final, but when it comes to the area of sexually transmitted diseases, failure could be fatal. I'm not trying to scare you. It's a fact. It might not be fatal, but it might stick with you for the rest of your life. One of the very final thoughts I share with you is that this is the truth. Bad never gets better longer. It only gets worse. The alcoholic continues to drink, which there's alcoholism on both sides of my family, my wife and mine. When you continue to drink and drink and drink, you lose the trust of your family members, you, you lose the confidence of your friends, and bad never gets better longer. And the same with the drug addict, the same with choices. So when you continue with bad choices, your life never gets better the longer you do bad. It only gets better when you change. It only gets better when you stop. I hope I've challenged your thoughts today. Don't know where you're at and how you feel about these things, but as you can see, I'm very passionate about it, and I'm absolutely convinced that every day I go to a public school, every day I go to a university, every day I stand up in front of a group of parents, I believe if I've helped one, my day has been successful. If I leave you with just some information, if you want to dialogue with me, connect with me, Twitter, Facebook, email, I'm not hiding out anywhere. That's how I get a lot of these letters these days in this generation. Young, talking to young people. Have a great day.